Good morning, everybody. Well, here we are, plugging away, right? I feel somewhat like we're in the middle of a storm, pandemic coming at us, racial tension, political issues. All we can see are waves and clouds and rain and wind. But you know, in the middle of a storm, you got to keep rowing the boat. The last thing you do is jump out. So God bless you. God bless you for being here today, putting the oar in the water and keeping your faith afloat. If you're watching online, God bless you. We've got people all over the world tuning in to these services. May God bless you. And if you're passing through a time of, of uh, personal difficulty, our prayers are with you. They really, really are. May the Lord give you strength and may he bless you. May he bless you. Uh, I need to convey our, our sympathies to the family of our dear brother, Rafael Rosales. Rafael has served as a missionary uh, to his native El Salvador as sponsored by our church now for 22 years. He passed away recently. Uh, Rafael had a deep appreciation for God's grace, a deep love for his El Salvadorian people. He had passed through many personal trials in his own uh, childhood, uh, had actually immigrated at one point into Canada. I recall meeting him a quarter of a century ago when he and his family were, were on a trip into the United States, and they came by our, our church building. He wanted to meet me. He had read a book I'd written, uh, one of my earliest books, and we had a delightful congregation, conversation. And uh, who would have thought that out of that would come a, a friendship and partnership that would last for a quarter of a century? He's in heaven now. He's in heaven. He's been delivered. Uh, and so we know that he is at peace. Our thoughts and prayers are certainly with his wife, Raquel, and their three children, Ernesto, Rafi, and Sandra. Many of you know we have a missionary garden, and um, it's on the south side of our facility here. He chose Philippians 121 as the scripture for his plaque. And that scripture reads, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. Amen. Heavenly Father, grant now your mercy upon this family. What a blessing they have been, continue to be. We thank you for a life well lived in the form of Raphael. And we pray a blessing upon his wife and children. May you bring comfort to them and may you bring a blessing to the sweet church that he has led for many years in El Salvador. And now, Heavenly Father, have mercy, please, upon our speaker. You know his sins are many. And help us to see Jesus and just Jesus. Through Christ, I pray. Amen. 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 Well, there have been some complaints that I have not told enough jokes during this sermon series. And so, as we begin to wrap this sermon series up, I've dug through the files, and I thought, now here's a good one. Doesn't have anything at all to do with the sermon, but it's a good joke. It's a good joke. The fellow came in from playing golf with his friend, the doctor, and his wife said, how was golf today? He said, well, how would you like it if somebody yelled in your backswing? She said, I wouldn't like it. How would you like it if somebody stepped on your ball when it's sitting there in the fairway? She said, I wouldn't like it. He said, how would you like it if somebody poked you with the putter right when you're about to putt? He said, I wouldn't like it. Or she said, I wouldn't like it. He said, neither does the doctor. <laughs> See, I, that's why I don't tell jokes. You don't laugh at them. <laughs> There's a big bug in the middle of Enterprise, Alabama. It sits on the statue of a Greek woman. She has white marble arms that extend high above her head, somewhat like the Statue of Liberty. Unlike her more famous counterpart, however, this Alabama lady does not hold a torch. She holds a bug. Well, strictly speaking, she holds a bowl, and there's a bug in the bowl. The bowl is the bowl weevil. The insect weighs 50 pounds, 
and is celebrated by a nearby plaque in profound appreciation for the boll weevil and what it has done as the herald of prosperity. The statue was erected in 1919. The bug was added 30 years later. Now, who does this? Why well, make a big deal out of an ugly weevil? Since its arrival from Mexico in 1892, the pest has cost the cotton industry some $23 billion. The insect does to cotton fields what teenagers do to pizza. Gone in a gobble. By the 1920s, the boll weevil was having its way with the Alabama crops. They could not and would not be eradicated. So why honor them with a statue? Well, the answer has to do with a seed salesman by the name of H.M. Sessions, realizing that the cash crop of the area was about to be destroyed. Uh, he went on a trip in 1916. He traveled through Virginia and North Carolina and saw peanut fields, and he came to learn that peanuts are impervious to the boll weevil. So he brought some peanut seeds back to the area of Enterprise, Alabama. And he recruited the help of a farmer by the name of C.W. Baston. Baston planted them and made $8,000 from his new crop. That's big money in 1916. It was enough for him to pay off all his bills and still have some cash left over. Word spread quickly. Farmers jumped on the peanut bus and drove it straight to the bank. By 1919, when the boll weevil scourge was reaching, wreaking its worst havoc, Enterprise Alabama was making a lot of money. It had become the largest producer of peanuts in the nation. I want to talk to you about your boll weevil. I want to talk to you about whatever it is in your life right now that's nibbling away at your harvest, at your happiness, at your heart. I want to talk to you about whatever scourge is wreaking havoc in your life. For many people, most people, it would be a pandemic. For some people, it would be the peculiar consequences of the pandemic, job loss, health loss, anxiety, isolation, loneliness, for many people, the pandemic has already only has served to exacerbate already existing struggles and fractures in marriages, in careers, in families. These are tough days. So I want to talk to you about your bold weevil. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to reframe the way you see this plague you know, the boll weevil has taken much for sure, but had there been no bug, there would have been no peanuts, or in your case, no struggle would mean no strength, no mountain means no mountain peak, no setback means no comeback, and my dear friend, a comeback is yours for the taking. Yes, I'm saying what you think I'm saying. Boll weevils make us better. Tough times make us stronger. That's the anthem of the story of the book of Esther. Now, if you're tuning in for the first time, you need to know that we're on the next to last message in a 12-message series based on an Old Testament book called Esther. It's 10 terse chapters. Read like a melodrama, complete with a villain, with Esther, the hero, Mordecai, the superstar, and King Xerxes, the facilitator. Those are the four main characters in the book of Esther. The problem is, in 5th century B.C., the Jewish people had been dispersed all over the then-known world, primarily in the region, I'm sorry, in the empire of Persia. They had no headquarters. They had no capital. They had no homeland. They really had no statesmen. 
they had no leaders. Where is David when you need him? Where is Moses when you need him? Where is Joshua when you need him? And the Jews were tiny minnows in the vast Persian ocean. Persia had a king who was a Laos. His chief of staff, Mordecai, was a Jew. I'm sorry, his chief of staff, Haman, was a Jew-hating thug. And the two Jews of prominence, Mordecai and his cousin, cousin Esther, had chosen to keep their nationality a secret. It wasn't the best of times for God's covenant people. Bull weevils everywhere. But then Mordecai and Esther planted some peanuts. Do you recall? He chose not to bow before the anti-Semitic Haman. And when he chose not to bow, that set in motion a series of events that resulted in Esther taking a stand for her faith that resulted in the destruction of Haman who wanted to kill all the Jewish people. Haman himself was killed on the gallows. He erected for Mordecai the people were saved and the plan for annihilation was according to Esther chapter 9 and verse 25 turned back onto its head and chapter 10 and verse 3 Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to Xerxes preeminent among the Jews held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of the people and spoke up for the welfare of the Jews so everything turned out greater than they could have ever imagined v-day eruption uh, celebrations erupted in all corners and a page was turned in the history of the jewish people indeed jewish historians point back to this time as a time in which jews in exile embraced their identity as god's covenant people and repledged their loyalty to their hidden yet powerful god now, to ensure that the Jews would remember this moment, Mordecai and Esther commissioned an annual celebration. It was called the Feast of Purim. Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time in which the Jews got relief from their enemies <clears throat> as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. The book of Esther does not end with a military victory. The book of Esther ends with a call to remember. Just as Christians read the story of the birth of Jesus every December in order to remember. So to this very day, the Jews read the story of Esther once a year at the feast called Purim. Now, odds are you've never heard a sermon about the feast of Purim. I know I've never preached one, but I discovered some interesting things about this annual Jewish celebration Purim holidays are rowdy affairs a bit like Mardi Gras uh, lots of costumes dancing eating gift giving and drinking as the story is read the audience reacts Haman's name prompts boos and hisses and shouts the idea is to muffle the very sound of his name there is a controversial passage of the Talmud in which Jews are instructed to drink wine until they can't differentiate between the phrases, cursed be Haman and blessed be Mordecai. That practice is really not recommended for the church. <laughs> a more reasonable practice would be the baking of the hamantashen, hamantashen, a three-cornered jelly-filled pastry. The three corners represent a three-cornered hat that, according to legend, Haman wore. The hidden jelly recalls the hidden presence of God. Now, I like that. Number one, I like jelly. It's sweet, it's tasty, 
And when it's hidden in a jelly-filled donut, surprise to discover. Amen? I like the idea that God's presence, scrumptious and tasty, is baked into the story of your redemption and mine. And I like the idea of a two-day celebration in which people of faith revisit the day and the way that God redeemed his people. I like that because we all tend to forget. We all tend to forget. We tend to forget that God is for us, not against us. We tend to forget that God is near us, not away from us. We tend to forget that God is busy working on our good, not sleepy, dozing on his post. Do we not suffer from spiritual amnesia? We need to remember. We tend to forget that God can create beauty out of ashes, joy out of mourning, an army out of a valley of dead bones, and rejoicing out of sorrow. And we need memorials. We need memorials that jog our memories. Hence, Purim. The most courageous celebration of Purim included no wine or pastries. There was none to be had. The celebrants were barely alive. The congregation consisted of 80 men crammed into a half-buried hut. Their bodies were racked by dysentery and typhus. Their clothing hung like rags from their skeletal frames. They subsisted on a daily portion of bread and soup. They had no hope. They had no solution. They were prisoners of Auschwitz. J.J. Cohen was among them. He was a teenager living in a Polish ghetto when he was taken to the death camp. He survived the Holocaust and later remembered the day the prisoners remembered Purim. He recalled how they took a fragment of potato and a small piece of bread and passed it from person to person in order to fulfill the tradition of giving gifts to one another. It fell to young Cohen to relate to the others out of his memory the story of Esther. Here's how he described the moment. When I read aloud about Haman's downfall, the spark of hope deep inside every Jew's heart ignited into a flaming torch. When I finished, everyone cheered. For a brief instant, the dreadful reality of the death camp had been forgotten. All the hunger and suffering had receded. Having exerted all my remaining energy in the reading of the story, I sat breathless but with my spirit soaring. And like a river overflowing its banks, the festive atmosphere and the vision of redemption burst out of the broken hearts of the camp inmates. I tried to envision those men, skeletal men, encircled by the harshest winter to ever be imposed upon a people. I inclined my ear into this moment to try to hear their cheer, anemic yet triumphant. And I wonder, I wonder what kind of story can do this? What kind of story can cause dead men walking to rise up in hope? And I wonder, do we not need that kind of story today? Do we not? Folks, we are worn out. We are worn out. The year has taken its toll upon our country. Cases of depression and anxiety are at an all-time high. There's a 26% spike in applications for divorces. We are worn out. And most tragically, the suicide rate continues to increase. We are in desperate need of hope. We're in desperate need of a Purim celebration. 
were in desperate need of a story of redemption. And by God's great grace, we have one. We have one. The Christian version of the Persian miracle involves not Esther in Susa, but God's son, Jesus Christ, buried in a tomb. And just as Haman declared a death sentence on the Jews, Satan declared a death sentence on the source of life himself. Jesus was in the tomb. Jesus the Christ was Jesus the corpse. There was no breath. There was no pulse. There was no hope. He was wrapped tighter than an Egyptian mummy, three days dead in a borrowed tomb. And his enemies raised a toast to a dead Jesus. His followers, well, they weren't scattered in the provinces of Persia, but they were hiding in the bare cupboards and corners of Jerusalem for fear that they would next be crucified on a cross on the hill of Calvary. Their world was broken. Their hearts were broken. They had left everything to follow Jesus. The fishermen had left their nets. The tax tax collectors had left their work. And now it seemed that Jesus had returned the favor. He left them. Thanks to three nails and a cross, the light of the world had gone dark, or so it seemed. The Savior of humanity couldn't save himself, or so it seemed. The hope was a hoax. The Redeemer was a joke. Jesus, the Son of God, had been done in by the devil. The Haman of hell, or so it seemed. But just when it seemed that all was lost, once again, God turned everything on its head. Peripety. A heart began to beat. Eyelids popped open. Pierced hands lifted. And Jesus stood up and placed his heel squarely on the head of Satan. And as Peter would preach, Christ was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And the God of the great turnarounds performed his greatest work. And so that we would never forget this moment, Jesus gave us our Purim celebration. On the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to the apostles saying, this is my body, which I am giving for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new agreement that God makes with his people. This new agreement begins with my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, these words are precious to Christians, but don't you think they were curious to the apostles? Phrases like a broken body, spilled blood, can anything good come from this? In you, you're asking similar questions. Can anything good come from a world gone crazy? Can anything good come from a job that you've lost, from a marriage on the rocks? Can anything good come from these bull weevil attacks? Esther says yes. Easter says yes. Purim says yes. Communion says, yes, this is the promise of God. It only falls to you and to me to receive the promise, to receive the bread, to receive the cup, to say yes yet again, to keep rowing the boat, to not throw in the towel, to not give up on life, to not cave in to despair. Some time ago, I received an email from a friend He had just returned from the funeral of his 96-year-old aunt. He wanted to tell me about it. Max, until about a year ago, you couldn't keep up with my Aunt Wanda. She had such energy, you just couldn't believe it. Her eyesight was failing so completely that her energy almost made it dangerous to go to unfamiliar places with her. Her eyes couldn't see the crack in the sidewalk that she was about to trot over at 90 miles an hour. About a year ago, she started having difficulty breathing. The doctor found a mass in her chest that was almost certainly cancer. But at 95, there was little reason to do surgery, even exploratory. The better plan was to keep her comfortable. 
It was only in the last three days of her life that the mass became painful to the point she needed medication to fight the pain. It became so severe so quickly that she was given enough morphine to sedate her and basically keep her in an unconscious state. But as she began to pass from this world into the next, her sight became clear. She was released of the pain, and even in her unconscious state, she began to have conversations with those who had gone before her. She saw her mother, who was her best friend, and talked to her. And my favorite part, she saw my dad and their brother. My dad and their brother, Uncle Marvin, were constantly playing practical jokes on their sister, Aunt Wanda. She always referred to them as the boys, or these boys, or those boys. I have no idea what they did or how they greeted her at heaven's door, but whatever it was made her laugh so hard she literally pulled her legs up to her chest and doubled over laughing. I can't believe you boys, she said. Oh my goodness, you boys. And she literally took her last breath laughing. I can't wait to find out what she saw. But she saw something grand. What kind of God is this that we serve who can take even the moment of death and turn it into a moment of delight? Who can take a moment of sadness And turn it into a moment of joy. Who can take the moment of tears and turn them into laughing and celebration. What kind of God is this? Let me tell you. It's the God alive in the days of Esther. It's the God alive in the joy of Easter. And he is the God who is alive today. Simply falls to you and me to receive the cup to receive the bread. So I close this message as earnestly as I possibly can because I know, I know, I know, I know that someone somewhere is hearing these words who is at the end of the rope. It was all you could do to tune in or show up. And you know who I'm talking to. And I'm begging you, dear friend, hang in there. Hang in there. For all you know, your turnaround is just a turn of the page away. For all you know, you'll be erecting a a statue to this bull weevil moment. For all you know, the God of Esther Easter and resurrection power is about to perform his greatest miracle. For the planet, for the country, and for you. Promise me you won't give up. Okay? Thank you, Lord, for stories like the story of Esther. Stories like stories of Joseph, Daniel, Gideon, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, Mary, Martha, Lazarus but most of all the story of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We receive your power today in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we celebrate you. And I beg you to have mercy, please, upon the weary, fatigued souls who hear these words. Through Jesus, I pray. And all the church said, if you could remain in a spirit of prayer for just a few moments, this would be time for you to Pray personally to the Heavenly Father who wants to hear from you, longs to hear from you. Just tell him what's on your heart today.
Christmas. Blessings, Lord. Blessings upon your church, upon all these precious, precious children. Thank you. Hear their prayers, please. Hear their prayers. In the name of Jesus, we pray.